Yes. All righty, everybody. I would like to introduce my new best friend, Ken Kruber, and he is going to be uh, demonstrating violent overview and how it can benefit all of us security professionals. So, ah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, Violent Ruby. Let's get into that. Uh, so I guess what he said who my name was, right? But who am I? Uh, I'm Kent. Uh, I consider myself sort of a creative professional. I say I'm a security researcher. I'm still in school. I do a lot of open source uh, programming and different programming languages. I sort of consider myself a polyglot, uh, someone who knows multiple languages, but in the context of programming specifically, uh, not like Italian and Spanish or whatever, right? Um, these are sort of the languages that I sort of play around with in my spare time the most. Um, I really like Python, Ruby, uh, Crystal, the middle, if you haven't checked it out, I'll get a little into that. Uh, Go to the right of that, and then Bash, because uh, who doesn't like Bash, right? So uh, I also consider myself a hacker, though this is a kind of a weird term, right? Uh, I don't know about that. But anyway, so, eh, whatever. I call myself a hacker anyway. Um, and then I have a blog, so that's cool. Who doesn't? Um, so like lessons from second place, uh, information security talent search, uh, uh, this was a competition that I went to. I got second place. Um, I basically detailed uh, some of the experiences that I had. Uh, we were really close to getting first, but there was just just, just a slight, you know, we didn't get there. Um, uh, but basically, I, I went over things like how I uh, looked at the application, so it was an open source CTF platform. Um, and so they were uh, coding that online on GitHub. And so I realized that they were doing that, and they were making these active commits on this new platform for this year. So what I did is that I followed that on GitHub, I admit, you know, cloned it, got my own copy, and then found vulnerabilities in the scoring engine so that I could, you know, tell them, hey, I found vulnerabilities in your scoring engine, so could you give me points, could you help me out? Because I can't really hack the scoring engines because I'd be out of scope of the competition, though I was able to figure out how to do that. Um, I also do like weird stuff like making like JavaScript charts in Ruby because why not? Who wants to do JavaScript? You can just do Ruby. So you can make good, you know, beautiful charts like this and the responsive. So again, it's the JavaScript that's rendering out. So you can just like put this in your HTML and have like, these beautiful charts with like basically this much code. And so it's not too bad. And so you get some like cool stuff. And I just like, again, I like programming open source projects and just stuff where like I needed to visualize stuff. And I was looking at different visualization technologies that are available to me. And uh, Chart.js was probably my favorite, but there wasn't like a Ruby library in order to like work with those JavaScript library, uh, work with that JavaScript library. So I wrote my own, and you know you can go use it, and you can use that to like do interesting stuff. I have another talk um, that I'll be giving, but uh, visualizing attack patterns. I also wrote a blog post on how to basically do that. But uh, my talk will be a little bit more in intense, where like I have like Elasticsearch and some weird stuff going on there. But anyway, um, again, just like finding like redundant Ruby gems. I really like Ruby, obviously. Um, so like basically, when you like load up Ruby, you require gem, just like you're importing stuff from Python. You're like pulling in libraries. If you do that in Ruby and you're pulling in these redundant gems, let's say you like pull in JSON, and then you pull on this like random gem that already pulled in like that JSON gem. All you had to really do then is just pull in that second gem and never pull in that JSON to begin with. So basically, you can just like find these redundancies, weird stuff like that. And not just Ruby, Python debugging. I like Python too, but Ruby's got my heart um, for packet analysis and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, bash, like bash plus vim equals a crypto locker, pretty simply. So basically, like, what does that look like? This is the guts of like that, where like basically uh, you set a passphrase. I'm just MD5 summing the date, which is like I'm kind of being really nice as a crypto locker, so it's not that bad. And then uh, curl data, so I'm just going to throw that over to some random host that I, I have. It's basically my my centralized uh, place where I'm basically taking uh, wherever the encrypted like password for that document was, and then sending it over to a place where then I can know the password, and you know, fun stuff like that. Um, and then basically, this is the actual Vim like command thing in order to make that crypto locker thing happen. It's basically sending a set key and then uh, setting the encryption. So fun stuff like that. I do a lot of programming. Um, I also like commit to like a project um, on GitHub called BetterCap, which is a man in the middle uh, framework. And it's pretty cool. So basically, uh, I've done stuff where like now when you run better cap without like sudo or root privileges, uh, basically it'll yell at you. It doesn't do the flip table. We'll get into that in a second. Um, basically, I really like flip tables and I really like exit codes that mean something. So when you run something in, in bash in, in your shell and it, it fails, there is usually an exit code that tells you it failed. It's usually a non-zero exit code. And so uh, a lot of programs don't really care about your exit code. Like, they'll just give you a successful exit code even though something did fail. So, like, weird stuff like that where I have a uh, simple little command line flip table thing where uh, in my prompt command, so before bash, the bash prompt loads up, basically I have this little flip table function that checks was the last command successful or not, and then it'll give you a flip table if it wasn't. 
fun stuff. Um, I also added the missing rainbow option inside of better cap because when you're doing your man in the middle stuff, uh, this is cool, but it's missing something, right? And it's missing the rainbow option. That way you can do it way better. You're hacking 10 times better, arguably. Um, so yeah, I really like the Ruby community. I like contributing. And in general, some people tend to like what I do. So that's good. Um, I've contributed to BetterCap. I haven't contributed to PacketFoo. Uh, PacketFoo is a Ruby library that inside of Metasploit, uh, that Metasploit uses. It's not just uh, for Metasploit. Um, but basically, it's a Ruby packet analysis library that's uh, pretty easy to use, and it's not too bad. But the problem was it is that there's a whole bunch of hanging pull requests for like stuff like IPv6 support um, that was just actually recently um, uh, actually uh, merged, but whatever. Um, during that time, a uh, Contributor to Packet, uh, Packet Foo, uh, Sylvian Daubert. I just butchered his name, I know it, but that's fine. Um, he does really great work, and he made this uh, library called PackageN. He is the number one contributor to Packet Foo. Um, and then he was just like, you guys just have a bunch of hanging pull requests, whatever, I'm going to go make my own. And then he made this like really great library where you can do packet uh, manipulation. So it's a mid-level packet manipulation library, uh, mid-level packet manipulation library, where like, I could do something like generate a packet, um, I could do uh, breeding packets off the, liar, uh, off the wire and then parsing that or whatever. Really fun stuff, I think. Um, and then uh, inside of the PG console thing, if I go back there, I loaded up this PG console. When you install PackageN, you get this interactive shell called PG console, and then you can do stuff. It's built on top of Pry, which I'll get into more of. It's a debugging um, sort of platform in a way. It's a replacement to IRB. You can sort of think about it as a REPL uh, for either Python or Ruby or any other languages where you're typing in something, and then you hit enter, and then it runs or it uh, loads up whatever stuff that you're putting into the shell, and it'll run that. So it's really great uh, library that you can do stuff, treat it kind of like a Unix philosophy, where like you have this object called packet they generated, and I want to LS the stuff that I can do on top of that packet. So, cool stuff, really great library. And then you can do stuff like, you know, set the IP source or whatever. And then, a whole bunch of different headers that you can use, really great library. And then, I'm sort of just like, I'm getting it to this point now, where this is a lot of just like my opinion, right? Like, a lot of this isn't just like hardcore fact or anything like that, but I, I have a lot of kind of strong opinions about Ruby where I really like it. It, it really got my interest, and it was really easy for me to start programming. Um, where I really didn't consider myself a programmer for the longest time. Like, when I was younger, I was doing a lot of, like, not front-end stuff. Like, I was, like, doing, like, Photoshop stuff. I was, like, I was doing a lot of graphics. I, I used to be an art major. Um, and then um, I, I got into InfoSec, and then I started, like, looking into programming languages because I was kind of looking at these tools that were available to me, and then I'd run into problems or it wouldn't work the way that I wanted to, and so I wanted to build my own tools. I needed a language to do that. Started with Bash, started moving other to other programming languages, did my Code Academy stuff, great. And then Ruby just really got my interest. And there wasn't this huge InfoSec community like it was behind something like Python or something like that, but there was still a community there. And it was still a really cool place to learn. And in fact, like learn other programming languages because that's part of the community in Ruby. Ruby, you learn Ruby, yeah, but in general, like a lot of Rubyists, they'll talk about how they're learning a new programming, uh, programming language every year. And then they can take those concepts and then bring it to Ruby and make it better or do whatever they want. Like, it's, it's a really cool, uh, uh, Ruby's a really cool platform where you can basically even, like, make your own mini language inside the language. It's really flexible and it's really cool. Anyway, so again, just like my opinion. Whatever. Um, so the density, <laughs> density of Ruby for this talk is going to be uh, pretty dense, but if we can tell by this sort of visualization, uh, if it's less dense and then more dense, more happy, more Ruby, cool. <laughs> and I'm dead serious about that. <laughs> So, uh, Ruby, off of the Rails. Um, if you guys have heard of Ruby, you guys have probably heard of Rails. Because people usually be like, Python versus Ruby on Rails. And you're like, what? what the, first off, if you didn't know, Rails is a web framework to build websites. Really like, rapidly, it has a, basically, it's a convention over configuration sort of thing. Basically, it has a whole bunch of different methods and magic built into the framework in order to build a website really fast. Scaffolding, all sorts of magic, and you can basically, you know, be a startup really easily and build on Ruby on Rails. But, uh, you don't need to use Rails to use Ruby. I do not use Rails at all, and I use Ruby, and I can build websites without ever having to touch Rails with Ruby, obviously. Uh, if you've ever programmed any other programming language and build websites, you can build a, basically a website with any other programming language you want. Um, and so, with Ruby, just Rails is just a framework on top of that that you can just totally ignore. And I, I honestly recommend it when you start. Um, and so, when you when you start off, you like Google like Ruby programming, like I want to get started, right? So uh, Ruby, uh, like what is it? It's a dynamic, reflective, object-oriented, general-purpose programming language. 
Basically, it's a really strong OO language, but it supports other types of programming par uh, paradigms as well. So I can treat my Ruby program as sort of like this mix between either like object oriented and functional, or I could treat it like very functional. I've uh, built libraries um, that are very functional, uh, and then I've built libraries that are very object oriented. And Ruby supports both of them pretty easily. It's not like, oh, I'm doing this like really weird thing in Ruby where I'm treating things functionally. In fact, like Ruby's like, yeah, that's cool, because it's a flexible language like that. Um, so yeah, don't worry about that guy. <laughs> so why I think Ruby is cool, this is like basically the talk, like, right? Um, I, I, hopefully you guys consider me part of your community, and um, I basically I want to share with you guys like why I think Ruby is so cool, and so you could kind of like kind of facilitate into the Ruby community and the infrastructure community, because I, I sort of want you guys to be uh, programming in Ruby, because you guys will, like, let's say you, you start programming and you're just going to like pick a language, or like a, a Python, you know, everyone's telling you to pick up the violent Python book or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then I don't see a lot of people even like have like open source repositories on GitHub. I'm not calling anyone out or anything like that. But like there was used to be like that whole like uh, mentality with Python where like people learning Python because they love it, not because they can get a job in it. Well, I've been told to learn Python so I can get a job when I'm doing Ruby. Like it's like weird like that where I don't feel like that paradigm necessarily always holds up right now because you have companies like Google and these really big companies backing this language and that's why you have really great libraries granted. Um, and you have a really great set of things to do, like, whatever you want, honestly, in Python. Whatever you want, pretty much. Um, and you can basically do the same thing in Ruby. It's not like it's impossible. So anyway, the community is really great. Um, and I think why it's so great is because the language itself really uh, speaks to being a programmer's best friend. And I think that's very true, where um, it doesn't force you to do something a certain way if you don't want it to do it that way, basically. Like, you can monkey patch yourself all the way to victory if you wanted to. Like, you, you download a library or whatever and you acquire it and it's breaking or whatever. Just monkey patch it, whatever you want. Like, you can do that. Some people may say, uh, well, that's kind of a weird thing in a language where, like, you can just monkey patch and change the, the core functionality of, let's say, like, like a string or something like that. Well, yeah, that's very cool. I like that. It's a hackability sort of thing where, like, I consider myself a hacker. And if I can literally fine tune things at, like, the very, like, not the very bottom level, because it's still, like, let's say an implementation in C, and I'm not gonna necessarily always write C code in Ruby, though I could, because there's an interface to be able to do that for the C Ruby implementation, which I'll get into. But, um, it's really easy to start kind of hacking away whatever you want to do with Ruby. Um, so, uh, it's built by really cool people. Uh, Matt's, on the left there. Um, he's really great. Um, and then Tenderlove, he's a contributor to Ruby and on Rails, and then the Rat Core team, he's really great. Um, does really great uh, talks. Like, if you want to just, like, Google and, like, learn a little bit more about Ruby, um, like, Ruby and then Tenderlove, and then you'll get great YouTube videos. Um, and Tenderlove is just awesome. You can follow him on Twitter and stuff like that. He's done, like, weird things like where he wraps the PHP uh, runtime in Ruby. So you can just, like, run, like, PHP code in Ruby if you wanted to. Not that you should ever use this in production or anything like that, but basically, again, it's like the hackability sort of thing where, like, you can do whatever you want and it's really cool. Um, not that you can't do that with other languages either. It's not a specific thing for Ruby, though Ruby kind of emphasizes that, I think. Um, and also he likes stuff on Twitter sometimes. But he doesn't follow me yet. Which is sad. Anyway, um, so uh, uh, Ruby, there's a whole bunch of implementations of Ruby, just like there's implementations of Python and other languages, right? So you have like this language that's really cool, but let's say it's slow. The traditional uh, core implementation of Ruby is called uh, MRI or C Ruby because it's an implementation of Ruby that uh, has C under the hood, just like to your typical like, Python or something like that, right? Um, now, other people have done other uh, implementations of Ruby, something like JRuby, which just has the Ruby syntax on top of the Java virtual machine, uh, which is kind of cool, where you can get a lot of speed increases by having Ruby on top of the JVM. And so uh, people uh, who, like, let's say Logstash, for example, that runs on top of the JVM, and it has Ruby co uh, code underneath. So pretty cool. Um, but there's also a language and sort of not really an implementation of Ruby, but something I kind of just wanted to share during this like whole like violent Ruby thing. Because if you ever like, Ruby's too slow or whatever, but I like the Ruby syntax quite a bit, but I want uh, more speed essentially, right? Crystal is a sort of newer programming language. It's, uh, I think, I'll say like four years old now. Um, still relatively new. <laughs> um, so basically it uh, has syntax similar to Ruby. So really friendly, really easy, uh, object oriented, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you literally get like C like speeds because it's built on top of the LLVM compiler. Um, a company called uh, Manus Tech um, is building out this language and uh, you can support it uh, 
and basically like contribute money to them uh, if you wanted to. Or you can contribute code because it's an open source project. Um, and it's really cool. Um, and I think you should check it out. Um, there's not a whole bunch of repositories, though there's sort of like this need for people to make repositories um, for this language. And it's not bad to do at all. It's very easy. Um, and I've tried myself and stuff like that. And uh, a lot of people are finding this language to be pretty interesting, just like kind of like a comparison. Not that this is any sort of like hard science here, but like just like Ruby got like 11,000 stars on GitHub. Crystal Lang has got 7,000 stars. Um, watchers, there's less watchers. Um, there's less forks. But there's way more contributors. I think that's cool. Um, and if we look at something like, like the C Python implementation, uh, Crystal has more stars. Which, again, this isn't any, like, specific hard science here, but I think this is kind of cool. And I think, like, it's even, like, talking, like, the same amount of, like, contributors here. Like, this is cool. Like, this is a very interesting language I just wanted to share with you guys so you can go Google it after my talk or whatever you want. Um, and you can do whatever you want. It's really great for command line applications right now. Like, I would say um, if you're going to build something inside of Crystal, you can build web applications really easily. Um, though, you can also build things that if you wanted to, like, let's say you're writing something in Go and you, because you're doing it for the speed and you're using because you can compile it to a binary. Crystal is sort of not necessarily an answer to that, but it's basically along those same lines. And in fact, like if you wanted to have a Crystal web server running and a Go web server running, they're very comparable. You get like very fast requests. You get millions of whatever, and you get C-like speeds. And I, I can almost guarantee that, I think. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, it's a really cool community too. So like you want to get started and you're like, ah, blah, 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 it's a new programming community. You don't have like these blogs that you can just easily go like get started with Crystal. There's not a whole bunch of them. Um, you can go on their Gitter. It's very active, and people ask questions all the time. And I was sort of just like browsing it and just like was looking for uh, things that I could potentially help with. They're just like things that I might be interested in from the language. And one guy was like talking about like turning stuff hash into a tuple or whatever. And I was like, could you just do that? Because I ran that and it worked. And he was like, yeah, it works. And I was like, cool, awesome. So you can help people. And I didn't even really like know a whole bunch of Crystal or anything like that. I was just like running it, and I knew a little bit of Ruby. And basically it transferred, like I just knew a tuple, well it sort of treats like an array and there's this method called two array, cool, and I can hash and I can basically take two arrays, a one that used to be a tuple, and then zip them together. So, really fun. Um, it also does like parsing like JSON really fast, uh, much faster than YAML randomly, but that's just because it does a C YAML limit. Anyway, distractions, uh, violent Python, right? Um, so, getting into that really. Um, so, uh, it's, it's a good book. You should definitely read this book. Um, if, you, if you haven't read this book, I think. Um, it's, it's not that it's like even like super modern, because it's still using, like for example, Python 2.7. Um, not that you can't get away with that or anything like that, for sure. You can definitely do whatever you want but in terms of like that, and people continuously do that. Um, and so like this is the Violent Ruby. We're going to have a little bit of comparisons uh, between the first couple chapters of Violent Python and Violent Ruby. I wish I could go through a whole bunch of them. I have a lot of code uh, on uh, GitHub. We have like vagrant files that you can easily like spin up, let's say, a vulnerable SSH box and then use, um, we're going to get into it, like an SSH brute forcer to then brute force that uh, vagrant box to get passwords or do whatever you want, right? So really simple stuff to get started with that the Violent Python book doesn't have and mine's free and all that. Anyway, so uh, when I first started doing Violent Ruby, it was on 2.3 um, and now it's on 2.4 and now I'm doing it in 2.4. Um, we hope you know that Python 3 thing. Um, <laughs> anyway, so when you look at Ruby code and um, Python code, in many ways, I can totally read Python code because I learned Ruby, like for real. Um, not that there's always those one-to-one -one uh, similarities, and there's some weird things like you get like these weird um, sort of like functional dec uh, like declarations in Python where like you can, anyway. So in Ruby and Python code, it just again, it's very similar. Um, and you'll see that, I think, especially if you know a little bit of Python. And that's super fascinating. So anyway, happy. Just want to bring that up. And I don't think that's a joke either. Like, I think, like, that whole, like, having, like, the friendliness, happiness, robustness built into that language, um, is really cool. Especially because then, like, when we're talking about, like, something like the Zen of Python, which, you know, cool, uh, you probably know this, import this, that's the Easter egg in Python, where it's basically this little poem, sort of, like, um, philosophies that kind of go along with that language. And one of them that I sort of, like, went through, and some of them I honestly don't know 100% what they mean, um, but that's whatever. But, like, one of them specifically I think is interesting is there should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it. And I think there's definitely a uh, computer science-y sort of dev, like, we have, like, a library, and you can, like, let's say, make something into an array of a whole bunch of different ways, and that can be really confusing uh, for, let's say, a new programmer, right? 
Uh, I kind of disagree with that, honestly. Um, I think that in some cases, when you say that there's a should be one way to do something, in many cases, I don't think that is always going to be the case. That you are going to definitely know every single case, and this is going to be the right way to do it. In some cases, I think there's definitely a way that that uh, makes sense, and I think that that should be built into the language. Though I think there is like that sort of like I want to be able to do it multiple different ways. I want to have that built into my philosophy because when I'm programming a language, it helps. Um, it actually like kind of influences the way that I'm thinking in a way. Like when I'm programming in Bash. Or I'm programming, you know, let's say a functional language. I'm I'm thinking um, very functionally, right? Because I couldn't suddenly start doing object orientation, uh, object oriented programming in Bash. Granted, there's like Bash Infinity where you can kind of start doing that, but it's a really weird, hacky way to do it, and it's not meant for that. And you feel like you're sort of like messing with the language in this weird way when you start like trying to do Bash and object oriented programming. Though in Ruby, though it's strong, as I said, as it's a strong object-oriented programming language, it supports multiple paradigms in this really flexible, really friendly, fun, interactive way, or whatever. And so, like when you get like these pitfalls, let's say, and let's say uh, Guido, um, like for example, he doesn't really like package management, or at least that's something that I've learned from Python talks. I don't actually, I've never heard him say he doesn't like package management, but I've heard a bunch of Python people say that he didn't like package management. And that's sort of like where we get like this weird Python packaging story, where like I don't know if you've ever like let's say wanted to package up a Python library. Not that it's impossible to do so, but you can get some really weird documentation when you start googling how do I start packaging up a Python library. And you're going to get a whole bunch of different ways. And so that whole, like, there should be obviously one way to do it, I don't think that always falls through in the language. So you can sort of have, like, this beautiful um, Zen, Python, whatever, code, uh, 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 poem. But uh, I think Ruby actually sometimes actually does it much better. And so I'll show you, actually, we're going to package up a gem. Um, and that's going to be really fun. Anyway, so uh, pythonclock.org. Also, like, Python 2.7, like, they have this whole, like, retire thing. And I don't think, like, a Ruby programmer built this. Python people built this so we can be like, hey, like, they were like, hey, it's gonna, we're trying to depreciate this, and it's been years now that they've been trying to do this, and so they have this Python clock that'll retire in like three years, without, more close, really close to three years. But anyway, so the Ruby Python code, let's compare that. So, uh, in Ruby, hello world, right? So you're gonna program in a language, you want to do hello world, I'm sure, 100%. Do you not want to do hello world? Okay. Anyway, so um, hello world, we do that in Ruby, easily does it in command prompt or whatever. Um, print hello world in Python, same thing. Actually valid Ruby code too, I like that a lot. Um, anyway, and if you want to do the new line, basically uh, in Ruby print is basically um, give me the characters and then I'm going to put it to the screen without a new line. Puts is give me the characters and I'm going to put it to the screen with a new line for you. Because usually I want a new line sometimes, sometimes I don't. It's very flexible that way. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Ruby Lang, let's say you're coming from a PHP, a Python, or a Java, or a C or C++. We weird, but cool. Um, so uh, coming to Ruby, it's very easy to do that. Uh, RubyLang.org has some guides to sort of like show you how to sort of get started if you want to do that. And it's very easy to. Like, it's not like I'm going to have to take hours to learn Ruby. Like, I'm going to have to like go through like these very intense like um, sort of like computer science-y like uh, mumbo jumbo. Basically it becomes like very human readable where it's almost like sentences. Um, oh, one uh, infamous, infamous uh, Ruby programmer um, called Y, uh, anyway, you can Google Ruby uh, underscore Y and you can hear that it's a really great story. Basically he sort of described uh, Ruby programs as like little sentences, little pieces of English that you're putting together to describe what you want the, the computer to do. And I think that is really cool, and I think that that uh, really plays into a lot of really interesting technologies that we can use in the information security community. Anyway, um, so uh, you can get started with Ruby really easily, and then, um, yeah, runs on a bunch of platforms. Cool. So object-oriented programming. Uh, this is object-oriented object program for sure. Um, so basically, you got a car, let's say, right? Because we have an object, right? A class, something that we're going to have, right? We're going to program, let's say, a car. I don't know why we're doing that. But anyway, so you have methods, things that you can do with that car, right? Things that it knows how to do, right? And then you have attributes, so things that those, basically, that those methods are going to start of influence under the hood inside of that object, inside of that class, right? And so, uh, and sort of just a kind of a silly example, right? You have a student, and you can see if they're allowed to wear a black hoodie or not by kind of just like, this very simple interface, we're making a new, uh, new student, and then we're basically giving it the age, and then we're checking if they're allowed to wear a black hoodie, if they're older than 12. I don't understand that one bit, but whatever. Um, basically, what this allows you to do is you're building up your objects and you're building up those classes, basically those interfaces to how a uh, someone's going to use your code or how you're going to use your code. Um, it basically really empowers you because uh, Ruby allows, really empowers you. Uh, you can basically do it however you want. Like if you're coming again from another programming language, you can map a lot of Ruby concepts 
uh, a lot of your other programming language concepts directly to Ruby, uh, or if you wanted to, again, like just sort of build a DSL to sort of do those kinds of things. It's really interesting. Anyway, uh, it's a really great developer tool chain. So again, that whole, like, if you wanted to package up a library in another, a programming language, let's say Ruby in this case, right? Uh, I want it to be really easy. When I have a thing that I want you to use, I want you to be able to download it very simply. Um, in this case, we're going to be using gems to be able to do that. So basically, I package up a thing in application. It could be a library, it could be a web app, it could be a command line application, it could be whatever. And I'm going to basically bundle that up into a gem. We're going to do that right now. Um, so basically, we're going to make something called a secure hasher. Um, it's going to be a non-secure hashing thing. That's not even really like ha anyway. So we're going to get into it. So bundling the gem. This is going to be the name of the gem, and it basically creates a bunch of directories for you. And this is where your code's going to live. And so we go inside of there. It created a code of conduct for me. I've basically opted in to always have this code of conduct. I really like this in the Ruby community, where basically it's like, hey, don't be mean to people. Um, I think that that's actually a cool thing to have, so that when someone is like kind of not so nice on, let's say, GitHub or something like that. You're like, hey, if you're gonna like contribute to this project, like, please don't do that because you're breaking, breaking the code of conduct. Like, it's interesting to have, and obviously you don't have to, you know, put that into your Ruby code. But I like having it there, honestly. Um, and then, you know, uh, MIT license. That's what I've defaulted to. Um, you can pick whatever license you want. Um, and then uh, you basically get this thing called a gem spec. This is basically just metadata that's going to describe your gem so that when people download it or whatever, all those dependencies are basically wrapped up and managed for them. And it's very simple to do this. So um, when we, uh, what we're going to do is we're actually going to remove some code. I like doing that. Um, basically, that was just like, uh, hey, delete this. It even like showed you, like basically prevent pushing this gem to rubygems.org. I want it to go there. Um, and then uh, I changed those to do's, which is basically the summary and the description. And if you didn't have some uh, things built into your gemrc, you wouldn't have like my email and my authors or whatever. Anyway, so, and then uh, as any uh, library or piece of code, I think, you should have a readme that's very strong. And, and I think in, in, uh, well, in, when you bundle up a gem in Ruby, you get this readme uh, documentation that's sort of boilerplate for you. And then I go in there and I kind of put in what I'm going to do. And then this usage of what I'm going to be doing. So it's sort of like a readme-driven development. And this is a very simple way to put that. But basically, we have the secure hasher, secure hash, give it a password, give it a salt. It's going to do a Unix crypt thing. Cool. So uh, we have, where we're going to put this code. We basically have this readme. It's not a test, so it's not going to test the code. We have this readme of basically what we want to do, right? So I want you to be able to do this. Um, and then I'm going to basically just uh, have this, I'm going to put a, uh, a file called hasher inside of this lib directory. Uh, the lib directory had a secure hasher uh, directory that was just the name of the gem. Just some like basic boilerplate stuff. Uh, secure hasher RB is basically just going to require all that stuff into one little namespace, sort of. And then the version is just going to contain the version. Those are just those two default files. Uh, I'm going to put where I'm going to have my code called hasher inside the secure hasher directory. And then uh, basically what I can do is I can actually just like copy that version into the hasher so I can keep that module thing in there. Just like a weird thing I do all the time. And then I'm going to document my code at the top and then I basically put like the actual code that is just that. Um, it's a secure hash, not really, or password, salt, and then um, it basically checks if there's password provided and then it does the stuff. It has a default salt too. Cool. So basically uh, secure, a one-way cryptographic hash. Ooh, super secure. Not really secure. This is just like a very simple idea of how you build up a Ruby program. Obviously, you would do something different than what this is doing, but it's a very simple uh, way to get started. And then when I had all that documentation at the top, which I really like, is that then this is generated for me when I run our Docker, when I push it up to Ruby gems. So that when you look at that, you can basically see what is the basic usage. How do I use this thing? Because a lot of the times I run across libraries. I download libraries all the time, and I want to do something with it. There's so many times that I have no idea how it wants me to do it. Like, I have no idea how you want me to take whatever library you've built and then build a chart, for example, if it was a library to build a chart. Um, if there was a readme to do that, to explain how this works, that's very helpful. And so I take this to heart where I want other people to be able to look at my code and be able to use it and be able to improve on it. The only way that's going to really happen is if they can understand like what I'm trying to do in the first place. Describing it, like putting it into words, like if you heard like the keynote talk, like describing like uh, in, in like detail, I think is super helpful. In this case, in, in, in the case of README or in something uh, you're describing how you want this library to act or how we want people to use it, you should definitely do this, regardless of whatever programming language you're doing. I think um, it's just going to make your life easier when you then kind of forget how it's supposed to work, like a couple months later, and you have to come back for a talk or something like that. But anyway. It's really cool. And then let's say you had that readme and you have um, some stuff that it does and now you want to make sure that it does it every single time, right? Like 
we have this library of code and definitely does secure hashing. Um, and then we want to make sure that, let's say, someone else comes around and wants to actually make it more secure or whatever, that it doesn't break our security that we've built in. I'm being very facetious when I'm saying security, obviously. Um, so behavior-driven development, um, RSpec is a really great framework uh, that Ruby um, has. It, there's other framework, testing frameworks that Ruby has as well. I find RSpec to be the most friendly, personally. Um, and so basically what I can do is I can RSpec describe the secure hasher, which is, that secure hasher is a, is a module, which is simply a namespace. And in Ruby, you really control your own namespaces. Um, and so um, you basically have this do, and then um, inside of that, what, it, what does it do? So we're describing that dot hasher thing, just that method, and you could do a different way to do that, but describe dot hasher, and then it will uh, hash a password with a default salt, and then it will uh, hash a password with a custom salt. And then there's these little tests. So inside of that block of code, inside those do, whenever there's a do and an end, that in Ruby uh, world, in Ruby uh, like syntax, it's called a block. And so uh, inside of that block, what will it do? And then it basically te uh, checks that it will actually do that thing. So password equals secure hash or secure hash, give it a password, expect password, and then zero two. So basically uh, in this Unix script passwording, uh, it's not like good at all, but basically you can check that the, the salt is the, basically the first two characters. Um, and that's very simple. So basically, expect the password, the, la uh, the first two characters to equal XX, because that is the default. And then uh, we can, if we gave it a custom one, we can check that that is set, is the custom one. This sort of methodology, and I'm going to kind of linger on here just a tiny bit, is super interesting in terms of, let's say I had uh, something that wasn't like a secure hasher. Let's say uh, it was a gem that I've also wrote called IP tables Z. I don't know, I haven't really decided how I want to, it's called IP tables, but it ends with a Z. I don't know why I did that. Anyway. So what I, I'm building up uh, is basically a way to take my <laughs> IP tables rules, um, and I basically built this like friendly Ruby interface to do that. Um, I don't think I have any examples in this uh, presentation. My other one I do. Um, but basically, uh, you can write these tests to describe how my firewall should be set up. And then when it checks like, oh, I should be blocking this IP or whatever, and then I check my rules, and then I don't have that thing that's blocking that IP, then I failed that test. And in terms of a security thing, when let's say I have a way that my firewall or uh, my whatever is set up, I want to make sure that that is the case. There's a whole bunch of other uh, libraries of code that have been written in Ruby to do this sort of thing. There's uh, one called server spec, which is where I took a lot of influence from. Uh, in spec for like chef stuff. There's a whole bunch of really great testing culture inside of Ruby that I think the influence that community should really check out. Um, and you should write tests for your other programs too, because you can usually write tests for whatever programming language you're in, you're getting your Go and you decide your Python or whatever, you should be writing tests, I think. It's a really cool practice just to sort of even get into. You don't have to write tests for every single method, though you probably should. Um, but you can just sort of basically give a rough idea of like what the main function of this library should do, or what the main function of maybe your firewall should do, or whatever, your, your SSH configuration, whatever. You can then have this as a human readable way to then run that test and check that it passed or failed. Anyway. So uh, I also decided to put in an error class, because that was fun. Basically, I'm just inheriting from standard error just to show you. Just like very simple, and then I can even put semicolons if I wanted to in Ruby. It's basically just end that class. So it's a one-line uh, class initialization, sort of. Um, and then inside of that uh, secure hasher thing, so inside of that lo a file that was created for me, right? Uh, and so I added the hasher one, and I added the errors one. But inside of uh, this file, I'm basically requiring all the code that I wrote previously, the version of the hashers and the error. So just three files, and then this is basically, again, a file that basically pulls them all in, so then when Ruby loads them up, it basically pulls from this. So, uh, and now I have those tests, right? I want to run those tests, and I want to see if they passed. And in my case, I have this thing that has colors, so when I have a uh, pass test, they're green, and when it's failed, it would be red. Um, anyway, it's really cool. So then basically, this is our gem that we just made. Pretty simple. Um, I push it up to GitHub, I have my README, you can then look at it like this, it is up on GitHub, um, and so you can then, like, oh, this is how you do it. Cool. Weird. All right, um, version. Oh yeah, basically I had to uh, change a little bit. So, almost like, it's almost, it almost is a gem yet. It's almost at the point where I can then push it up to RubyGem so that you can do gem install secure hasher, right? So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, basically put in the home page, which is that github.com pycats thing. I pushed it up to GitHub, but it's not, it's not existing on RubyGems yet. It's not uh, something I can, you can just like install without having to do a git clone. Um, so then I basically put in the home page, because that was a to-do that was left in there. Um, and then I run my tests just to make sure that they're working. And at the very bottom there, I had this bundle exec rake release. 
And so that did a bunch of commands for me that basically then packaged up my gem and then pushed it up through gems for me so that now, if I wanted to, I could do gem install secure hasher, or you could do it on your machine or whatever, um, and then you can install that gem, and then you can use it. Uh, and then if you go to Ruby doc and then look at the actual like secure hasher documentation, you can use, look how to use it and if you don't have it on GitHub or something like that. And then I think this is a really cool uh, developer tool chain in order to build tools. And obviously you don't have to push things up to Ruby gems to let's say you have uh, gems inside of your organization that you don't want to be pushing up to Ruby gems, not, not everything you want to do that. You can basically host your own sort of like Ruby gem server so you can ha uh, have an internal Ruby gems sort of repository. So I then you build really cool tools. So basically, let's say I had that secure hasher thing, and then I'm going to build on top of another one called trollop, which is a command line option parser. Um, and then I have a colorize that will give me color. Pretty simple. Um, and then I'm going to do something kind of helpful. I think I'm going to default to a help menu if there's no user input given. So if I run a command line application, and then it didn't have, like let's say, a tack h or a tack whatever to do something with that command application, you probably don't know what you're doing with it. Or maybe there, maybe there's a default behavior, but you probably don't know what you're doing with it. So I'm just going to default to a help menu to show you what you can do with it. Um, and so like that's basically line eight there. It's basically just checks argv, so those are the command line arguments. Um, it just checks if there's a zeroth one, so that's basically the first one. I could also do argv.first. It's basically another way you could do that. Is one better than the other? Maybe one of them's a little faster. But in the context of, let's say, this, do I need it to be faster or do I need to convey the meaning to another programmer more easily? I've decided to do tag zero because I, I mean the, the, the zero because I wanted to. There's not, it's an opinion, right? Do whatever you want. Um, anyway, option parsing. And if you wanted to, you could also like contribute this and change that if you want it to be more readable. You can do that. I, I, I recommend if you want to like start doing Ruby programming, check out my repositories. I want you to check out my repositories. But like, check out my repositories, and if you see something that's bad or whatever, and you want to, or you don't know like a lot of GitHub stuff, like my gems, or my repositories would be a really good place to then do that, especially if like the secure hasher thing, or any of like something like this, where it's I don't know, you can do whatever you want with it, and that can basically like pull request that and merge that. And I really like doing that stuff because not it doesn't happen all the time in my repos, so I really do enjoy like showing people how to use Git because a lot of the times people aren't doing it because they don't know how to, and it's pretty simple. I'm not going to go into the, how that all works, but I recommend it. Um, so uh, options, and then I have a version, because I wanted to, a banner, because I wanted to. Those are totally optional. Um, and then opt password and opt salt. So uh, these are behind these little like colon password, colon salt. That colon password or colon salt thing, whenever there's like a little colon, and then there's like a look whatever, and then it's basically a, s a single color, it's a symbol. In Ruby, uh, there's this uh, thing called a symbol, uh, which basically can just represent this namespace, and so you can do really cool, interesting. Uh, you can really, uh, you can do interesting things with that in terms of like wrapping uh, that behind, let's say, an idea or let's say a command line flag in this case, um, and and it's really cool. Anyway, so password, so uh, that colon password thing, and then it'll basically uh, figure out that all right, so password, and then if you wanted, uh, it'll figure out that uh, that tack, the lowercase p. If you did tack uh, p, then it would be the password option, and we'll show you that. Um, and then uh, salt. All right, cool. So, and then perform the logic. So if we got a salt option, then we're actually going to secure the password. So if we run the program, we get the default help menu, cool. If we run it with attack P and then there's no parameter, I didn't do anything to enforce this behavior, but it basically says, hey, you should try help if you don't know how to do this, but it needs a parameter. And Trollop does that for you. It's, it's just a really helpful, uh, friendly interface. There's a whole bunch of different ones that do command line application parsing in Ruby and make it really friendly. Trollop is just one of them. Um, so tack V for version, tack S needs a parameter. And if I actually gave it stuff, it would then do the actual stuff, right? So cool, pretty straightforward. Um, other <laughs> gems have been created that do interesting stuff. Um, and I'm just going to highlight them kind of very simply, because I, I went over that very, that secure hasher thing to show you how to build a gem, because I want you to build your own tools with Ruby, but there's all these libraries. That I, I'm building a tool, but I'm not going to, that secure hasher thing doesn't show me anything of how I can build something meaningful in, let's say, my organization or in my, my workflow or whatever. Um, uh, for InfoSec, I think packet analysis is an interesting thing. Uh, uh, in Ruby, uh, there's this great packet analysis library I mentioned earlier called Packagen that I help contribute to. And so uh, you can basically generate packets, and then if you don't know anything about packet analysis, I learned not everything I learned about packets or anything like that, but this is a great interface to be able to sort of explore um, how packets work, 
how I can um, do interesting things. Like let's say I wanted to set the ID or the link or the protocol. I can set those to arbitrary values, and you could easily do something, let's say, like a like a, a kind of like a secret backdoor sort of thing based on packet foo, where I can send out kind of uh, basically change, let's say, IC, uh, ICMP packets that are then uh, at my C2 over or like whoever I'm collecting that packet from. If I'm you know trying to get out the host, I can then collect that information, and then based on like whatever uh, secret I've set up in my packet. Um, in my packet like logic, then I can have a backdoor, or I can have any sort of communication. Packets are really interesting, obviously, and I think this is a really great library in order to start working with that. Um, and if you want to do that whole rainbow thing that I mentioned earlier, just require lullies forward slash auto. I think you should do that for all of your applications. Again, it's really going to make you hack ten times better. All right, so, um, and then like let's say you had like a, a URI thing, sort of just like these are basically little, um, I guess, Swiss Army knife sort of thing. So uh, we have like this URI escape uh, thing based on this URI gem. So basically, I can safely escape something for like HTML or whatever. Um, so let's say I had a bunch of owl emojis. It will do that. Um, if you're wondering if it does cat heart emoji things, yes, it does. Um, and let's say you had a super secret uh, base64 thing you wanted to do. You require base64. Who doesn't deal with base64 all the time? And then uh, base64 encode a string or decode a string. Pretty simple to do. And again, like that's just sort of like very bare bones sort of like uh, packet manipulation, uh, hashing or like base64 stuff, whatever. Those kind of are the key kind of uh, things to get started with, I think, when you're starting to program with Ruby. And then you can build out from there. Because there's other libraries that do uh, interesting, uh, cool, cool things as well. Um, but basically, they all kind of fall behind this sort of friendly interface thing. So to do that whole um, uh, packet manipulation thing, for example, it's very simple to do. Um, and it's basically, if in my opinion, it's very human readable in that case. Uh, instead of something like, let's say, uh, Go, for example, I don't consider it as human readable as something like Ruby, though it, Go is readable. Most programming languages are readable. Though I can, in, gen in general, usually read a program in Ruby line by line, sort of like, again, like sentences, how it's going to actually perform the code under the hood. Um, so case packet, at the IP destination. So the IP destination of the packet case when it's 8.8.8, oh, such Google, when some Malaysian IP, Malaysian, else, I don't know what to do with it. But it's, I can read that, and I can very easily understand what's going on there without, have, uh, without having a whole bunch of like if then, if then, if then, if then, just like case whatever happening inside of this packet. And again, just like really interesting sort of like uh, programming, uh, not shortcuts um, that are specifically just for Ruby, but just like kind of interesting uh, sort of like logic flow things that you can experiment with Ruby very easily. Because again, it's a very flexible language where you're not forced under the certain uh, sort of mindset. Um, so let's say if packet hacked, or we could do as just like a one-line ternary, uh, tertiary operator. I butcher that word all the time too. But basically, one line, uh, packet IP destination equals 19.2, 68.0.2, uh, then, then we're hacked. Otherwise, we're very safe. And thankfully, we're very safe and again, sort of like an arbitrary example, that's not the security that you're going to build in your organization, but like that's sort of a base level of like, I can build a packet spec library to check that packets that I'm going to parse much later because we're going to be packet, uh, parsing packets in Ruby or any other language that's interpreted. It's going to be kind of s slow. Um, but anyway, so you can parse that out later or you can parse little batches of it and check like what's going on inside that data, inside again like a very human readable uh, understanding of what it should do, for example. Um, and if we wanted to start working with Ruby, I said, I said pry earlier. I really think pry is a really great tool you should work with. Um, basically, you can sort of think of it as like your, your uh, uh, IPython sort of equivalent. Uh, so basically, I can create a string. I've already set it to this is a string. And then, again, that Unix philosophy so I can, what can I do with that object? Like, what are all those methods that I can do that we, we talked about earlier, like a car, like that get fuel thing? If I just had like this car equals car, Class dot, or this uh, car dot new thing. What can I do with that object uh, inside of pry? We can just like ls, like so you can ls on a file and look at all the things that are underneath that. We can check uh, basically things that we can uh, comparable, so we can check if it's in between something or whatever, or we can do certain methods on that uh, string, so we can check if it's empty, or if we have an exclamation mark, basically it'll change what's happening in that packet. So if we had um, string dot reverse, and then we check that string later, it would still it's a reverse string. Um, so interesting sort of uh, syntactic things that aren't even enforced all the way. So there is a downside there where you could have a method and you expect a method on an object with that exclamation mark thing to change that object. So you don't have to do uh, object equals object dot, uh, dot reverse. You can just do object dot reverse exclamation mark. 
So in Ruby, again, you can try to change whatever you want under the hood. So I could have a method that has an exclamation mark that I've made myself or I changed, and then it won't do that. So you can do whatever you want. So like, let's say that wasn't working for you or whatever, you could change that. Interesting. Um, and then, uh, again, just like probably you really get into the code. <laughs> um, and then so, like, for example, just like, I, I keep showing package gen because I really like the library. Um, basically, again, require package gen. I get the, the context of all this stuff. I can ls on package gen, which is just the actual um, module namespace for what is all the stuff I can do inside of package gen, inside of the library I just downloaded or uh, pulled in. Uh, ls package gen, I can create a packet. I can ls what I can do on that packet. And then I can sort of have this very simple REPL workflow to start working with my program. And I can even set breakpoints. So let's say I have a library that I have no idea what it's doing, but like there's this weird function that breaks for whatever reason. I don't know why I didn't write the library, but I know Ruby a little bit, right? And so I can basically set a breakpoint, uh, like right when that method's called, or ins inside of that method uh, syntax, so like def, like whatever, and then inside of there I can set a breakpoint, it's just binding.pry. And then when I load up my Ruby code, or when I load up like whatever that code is, and I run it, whenever it hits that code, because it'll run, it'll run the lines of code, right? Whenever it hits that line, it'll give you this interactive breakpoint where you can then start doing stuff, whatever in the context of that library. And you can do this in a lot of different gems, where you can even, uh, you can, and you can do this basically any gem, you can do this in any Ruby program. Um, and so whenever you have a question and why, like why it's breaking, if you can like see the line where it says it failed on this line, just set a binding.pry before that line, check what is like going on, in that, in that context, right? So like, like, let's say I was expecting to get an IP thing, but then there's no uh, Ruby code underneath that that actually checks that an IP should always be given for that method. So then that could be an interesting thing you can then contribute to that project. So anyway, yeah. Um, and then if you wanted to like do Windows stuff, I do a lot of like OS 10, a lot of Linux development, and I don't do a lot of Windows stuff. Um, just got pulled this off of Ruby for pen testers. So if you want to like Google, like I'm not the only one that's sort of like trying to like perpetuate this agenda. And it's, people have been doing it for actually a while now. Um, anyway, so require win32.ole, whatever, and then we can start doing stuff with, let's say, Internet Explorer. Cool. And then very simply we can understand like what this was doing, right? That sets it divisible and then it navigates to a thing and then it just sleeps until there's a ready state that equals four, whatever that means. Um, and then let's say we want to automate like a browser. You know, let's say you have a web application and it requires like this user input and it's super repetitive. I had to deal with this before. <laughs> so uh, I was basically uh, sort of a copy paste monkey where I was like, I was basically told like we had this one web application. I was our old, uh, when I worked at uh, my university. Uh, basically, we had this old e-learning uh, e instance and then we had a new e-learning instance. So it was called e-college and then Canvas. That was the new platform to do your, your online schooling. And basically, uh, take that information that's in eCollege, there's no simple way to parse that or take that stuff and then port it right into Canvas. There were some tools that they were building, but they were breaking all the time. And so basically, I was hired as like a meat body, copy paste monkey thing, to then copy paste that stuff. I didn't want to get carpal tunnel. <laughs> I didn't, and I already do enough programming that like, I, I just copy pasting all day. Like I could listen to podcasts, but it was just really terrible. And so basically I used uh, water, or I think it's called waiter water. I don't know. Anyway, I don't know how you pronounce it. Whatever you want in Ruby, right? Um, so and then create a browser. I mean, in this case, I want to do a Firefox instance. I'm going to go to that URL, and then inside of that HTML field, if there's like an ID that equals that username or whatever, then I'm going to set it to username, password, set it to password, and then I'm going to click a button. And basically, on top of that pry thing again, right, I could, if I, let's say I wanted to automate a browser, and I want to do that kind of like interactively, where I could then require uh, water, I can require package in, I can re kind of drive a, uh, a browser instance without having to like touch the browser. And I found it a really powerful tool set in terms of like, all right, so I had this web application, right? That was the old e-learning instance and it had some stuff that I needed to basically just kind of replicate over into the new one. They didn't have the import tool. I was able to write my own basically just by like reading the stuff off the web browser, reading the HTML, reading whatever I could get from that instance of browsers. You can do a whole bunch of things with it, right? Um, anyway, so really cool, really powerful tools, I think. Um, you can even do like, interesting like command line things very easily. Like for example, um, Herb is just an interesting library where you could do uh, extend Herb console and that's basically just gonna do a little bit of namespacing stuff where basically inside of our context we're gonna do a little bit of Herb magic inside of the library. Um, and this isn't the case for all uh, all Ruby uh, programs or anything like that, but it's because, uh, because it's so like flexible or whatever, let's say in this case, this is how you should use this library and this is how the library um, author basically shows you how to use it in the readme. 
So extend herb console, and then this table thing, this date today, date uh, today next month, and then there's some fields for that table, right? And then it basically makes that. And I can even do something like, here's, give me a menu prompt or whatever. So it gives me that table, and then it basically does like so many choices, so little time, and then I'm going to pick two, and then it recognizes you pick two. It's pretty simple. And there's a whole bunch of, uh, again, Ruby libraries and Ruby applications that are built uh, by InfoSec community people. And then I think really interesting to check out and learn from, like this one, uh, Birdwatcher. I don't think I'll have enough time to really get into it, but it's really cool. Uh, WordPress scan, again, very cool. Uh, black box, sort of like WordPress testing stuff, where you have a WordPress instance, or you know there's a bunch of WordPress instances out there. Um, you can very easily understand what's going on at that WordPress instance. Um, and I've, I've had to manage WordPress instances before, and this is a really great tool. Um, a Metasploit, right? <laughs> Um, so, really quick, uh, some kind of like Ruby versus Python stuff, I guess, or getting to the end of this really. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Ruby, Python, uh, Unix password cracker, very simply, this would be the guts of that Ruby, uh, that uh, Python uh, stuff, uh, and then this would be the stuff from the Violent Python cookbook. Uh, so, basically, you go through that, you test the password, and then that's the main function. And then, basically, it'll run if we are the name of the program that we're running or whatever, then we'll run the main function. And so that would be that. And then in Ruby, I don't have to do like import crypt.crypt .crypt or anything like that. It's just very simple. It's actually already there for me it's on a string. So I can just do egg.crypt and I can get that. And I can basically write the equivalent in Ruby very simply. And this actually kind of looks very similar to the Python one. Uh, less lines in this case, though we could refactor the Python one a little bit more. So uh, you can go download a Unix password cracker that I wrote that's a little bit more uh, Ruby-like. Um, but yeah, I'm getting... Very, very close on time, I'm noticing. I have a few more slides, but it's all right. <laughs> anyway, so going through that, let's just get to a fun one, like FTP cracking, SSH brute forcing. Um, basically, really really fast without having to like go through, like, this is how I wrote the code. Basically, the, the end of the day, uh, really kind of like, uh, not putting it crudely or anything like that, but basically, I can create libraries in Ruby that are very friendly, and then uh, let's say I had the SSH bruteforcer.new, and it exists. You can go download that. It's uh, basically gem install violent Ruby, and then you'll be able to use this. And then uh, I set my users, my passwords, my IPs, my ports, and then I want to brute force. So SSH.bruteforce, exclamation mark, because we mean it. Um, and then it's a very simple, uh, simple interface that we can then sort of replicate over to an FTP brute forcer. The same sort of interface, same sort of uh, uh, design, basically. And so you can sort of think of this as like almost like UX design. Um, and so it's sort of like building like the internal API. And I think Ruby is a really great uh, programming language to sort of explore that. And I find it terribly fascinating, personally at least, um, because I want to have a piece of code that's easy to use, friendly for other people to use. And like you get why it exists, sort of. Um, so anyway, that uh, user design includes the code style, the documentation, help menus, defaults, clarity, expressiveness, humor, uh, elegance, fun, lots of fun. Um, and basically, I, I want to use libraries I build in whatever the programming uh, language I'm working with, and I want you to do that too. Um, so basically, inside of Ruby, what I find sort of the most fascinating bit is um, you have this call site. And this is kind of a, a little um, computer science-y. We have this call site, and objects uh, have their own little interface based on their class. And so let's say you have this SSH object, the SSH fake new, so it's of this SSH fake class. That underscore red thing, that's where I put a dot to do, let's say, whatever, brute force or whatever, right? Um, so whatever method that is, that is sort of the user interface that we're building. So we could do ssh.do, and then in that shell instance, exec an ls command, for example. So you can build up these very simple interfaces that kind of convey what they do in a really elegant way, I think. Um, and then we can just take a rest um, because uh, we're going to build a REST API in Ruby, a little web application stuff to end it, really. Um, so basically, require JSON, because my REST APIs do all the JSONs. Uh, Sinatra, which is a, uh, a framework that I think you should look into. Basically, it's your equivalent to like Flask. There's a whole bunch of Sinatra clones. Like, if you wanted to like uh, uh, program a thing in like a Sinatra-like thing in your programming language, you can probably just do like Sinatra clone your programming language and find one. Um, so require violent Ruby to require the namespace for all the code that I've shared, basically. Uh, you can do gem install that gem, uh, gem install violent Ruby, and then you'll have that code. And so you could create something like this very simply. So post crack password. So when someone does a post request to the server, 
Um, we're going to do some stuff, content type JSON. We could do a little bit more error checking, but just very simply, right? Config the file parameters, the file temp file, dictionary, params, dictionary. And then stream to the user. We're going to do this little out thing, right? So violent Ruby, Unix password, new. And then we have this config that we created earlier with that file and dictionary. And then we're going to crack. And so we're going to do something with that result, and we're just going to basically turn that into JSON, add a new line at the end of it, because that's just nice to do uh, for formatting in the command line. Um, and then we're going to send that to the out object that's then going to stream that stuff uh, to the user. So we basically, very simply, implemented a streaming Unix password cracker um, that you can then implement this philosophy to do a whole bunch of interesting things. Um, I'll have a talk uh, 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 in another day or two on uh, building up basically uh, a lot of interesting things with APIs. And so in this case, you can build like a streaming password API. And this is how you use that with like curl, for example. You could use that in whatever programming language you want if you had like a basically an HTTP client thing that's going to work with it. Anyway, so that's, that's the end of that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions. I'll, I'll take them. I don't know if I, or whatever time it is or anything. All right. Cool. All right. Thank you.